Um, so hi everyone. Um, thanks for coming to the Unit 4 Biology Revision Lecture. Um, my name's Eve and I'm a VC Science Tutor. And joining me today who will also be presenting is Navni and she is the VC Science Lead. So um, before we start, I'd just like to let you all know that if you do want to keep up to date with um, what is going on with TFI, please do um, subscribe to our mailing list as well as follow us on our social media. Also, if you do have any questions at any stage, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll try to answer them as soon as possible. Um, also, then you all know that um, there will be a PDF of the slides that will be provided to you all after the lecture. Okay, so, oops. Yeah, so we'll just start with error study one. So I'm just gonna talk first about mutations. So before we go into mutations, let's just revise a bit about alleles and genes. So what is a gene? So a gene is a sequence of DNA nucleotides that code for a specific protein. So if you think back to your transcription and translation, a gene is that DNA sequence that will be transcribed to form the mRNA. The mRNA is what is then translated to form that um, protein that you want. And then what is an allele? So alleles are alternate forms of a gene. So if you're considering the gene for hair color, for instance, um, different alleles of hair color would be, for instance, an allele for black hair color or an allele for blonde hair color. Um, when we're talking about like alleles and genes, we also have certain definitions that I'm just gonna go through. So um, for a gene pool, this is when we're talking about all the alleles present in a population. So if you're talking about hair color, the gene pool would be all the alleles for hair color. So this is gonna include the alleles for like black hair color, blonde hair color, red hair color, brown hair color, and all the other hair colors. Then for allele frequency, this is when we're trying to work out the frequency of a specific allele. So for instance, if you're trying to work out um, the frequency of the black hair, um, black hair allele, what you're gonna do is that you're going to count all the black hair alleles, and then you're going to divide that by the total number of all hair color alleles. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about mutations. So what are mutations? They are permanent changes in the DNA sequence. And they can occur due to things such as damage to the DNA. And this can occur due to um, factors such as UVA radiation, so from the sun, or things like smoking. They can also occur spontaneously during DNA replication. That's because during DNA replication, some of the enzymes, when they're um, replicating the DNA, they can, um, instead of, um, they can sometimes make mistakes when they're replicating the DNA. So because you have a change in the DNA sequence, this then leads to a change in the protein. And this change can be beneficial, harmful, or neutral. And that really just depends on the nature of the mutations itself. Um, what's important about mutations is that they are random. You can't kind of pick what mutation you want. They just kind of occur randomly, um, no matter what you want. And I guess the benefit of mutations is that they are a source of new alleles in a species. So this means that they can help to increase gen genetic diversity within a population. So this, this diagram is just showing that this is a gene. So the gene is made up of DNA nucleotides and these will form chromosomes. So now I'm just gonna talk about the three different um, types of mutations. So we have our point mutations, our um, block mutations, as well as our frame shift mutations. So with point mutations, it's a point mutation. So what happens is that one base will be replaced with another base. And here are three types of point mutations. So there's silent mutations. So in silent mutations, what happens is that um, the change in the um, DNA sequence actually results in the um, production of the same polypeptide. And that's because if we remember, the genetic code is actually degenerate which means that the codons, um, more than one codon can actually um, encode for the same amino acid. So here, if we look at this sequence here, you have UGU and it has the U, which is the last um, base in this codon, has actually been mutated to C. But because UGU and UGC both encode for um, cysteine, you end up with the same amino acid. So here you can see that the polypeptide sequence hasn't actually changed. So the protein that you produce will be the same protein. And as a, result of, as a result of this, the mutation actually has like a neutral effect. However, in the case of missense mutations, 
This is when the um, mutation actually results in a codon that encodes for a different amino acid. And as a result of this, you actually get a change in the polypeptide sequence. So the protein function will be affected. And depending on the actual mutation, this can be beneficial it could be, or it could be harmful. In the case of nonsense mutations, what happens here is that the um, change in the base or in the codon actually results in the, um, the codon here actually is a stop codon. So what happens is that you get this premature stop codon. And as a result, you're going to get your, you're, you're going to get premature termination of protein synthesis. And you're going to produce a protein that is shorter than what was normal. So now moving on to your frame shift mutations. So these include um, insertion and de or deletion of a nucleotide. So what happens is that after the um, particular insertion or delete deletion, what actually happens is that the entire sequence of DNAs after that insertion or deletion is actually changed. So that means all the polypeptides, all the amino acids after the uh, mutation, they're gonna be different to what is normal. So you're gonna get a different amino acid sequence and a different polypeptide. Now moving on to block mutations. So these are occurring, occurring at the level of the chromosome. So these would be um, affecting multiple genes. So if you think about it, they're gonna have quite more significant impacts compared to the point mutations. And these mutations also occur during meiosis. So meiosis is just a um, method of cell division. So examples of block mutations include deletions. So this is when you get a section of your chromosome and the material just gets totally deleted. For translocations, this is when you get um, one section of your chromosome and then it attaches to the end of another chromosome. For inversions, this is when you get part of a um, chromosome, it um, undergoes breakage and then it like reverses on itself. So it flips around and then it goes back to the same spot, but now in a um, reverse direction. For duplication, this is when you get a section of DNA and it copies itself. And as a result of this, you ha now have, instead of just one copy of that section of the chromosome, you have two copies of that section of that chromosome. And um, it can be neutral, like it, have, it can have no effect on the organism, but sometimes it will cause detrimental effects. And that's because if you think about it, because you have two copies of the same DNA, you're gonna have increase in the gene products. So the proteins that those um, gene segments are encoding for. And this can have bad effects on the organism. So now we're gonna talk about some chromosomal um, abnormalities. So as you guys all know, um, us humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, so we're diploid. So we have 22 autosomes, so that's the one to 22. And then we have a pair of sex of chromosomes. So if you're a female, that's XX, but if you're a male, that's XY. But sometimes um, this doesn't happen. So for instance, in aneuploidy, um, what happens here is that you have an abnormal number of chromosomes. So in the case of Down syndrome, which you guys may have heard of, instead of having um, two chromosome 21s, you have three chromosome 21s. So now instead of having 46 chromosomes in your um, genome, you have 47. And this, because of this, you can have problems. Um, in the case of polyploidy, um, instead of just having one extra chromosome, this is talking about having an extra set of chromosomes. So instead of having 46, you can have like um, 69. Um, and this is sometimes seen in plants, but it's not really viable in humans. So um, here's just a question for you guys to try. Um, I'll give you guys like one minute to try it out. If you wanted to put your answer in the chat, um, feel free to do that. see. Okay, we have an answer. Yeah, that's correct. So in this case, um, this person has three copies of chromosome 13. So we have one extra chromosome. So that's aneuploidy. Um, it wouldn't be polyploidy because polyploidy is when you have an extra set of chromosomes. And the frame shift mutations or block mutations aren't at the level of the chromosome. They're at the level of the actual DNA sequence. So it wouldn't be those two answers either. So good job. 
So now we're gonna move on to talk about evolution. So what's evolution? It's the heritable changes in the genetic makeup of a population over time. And there's many ways that evolution can occur. So one way is by mutations. So as I mentioned earlier, mutations, they can um, introduce new alleles into the population. So that can, and then these alleles can be um, passed on to future generations and that can um, lead to evolution over time. But we're also gonna talk about some other mechanisms which include genetic drift, gene flow and natural selection. Sorry. So first to talk about genetic drift. So this is when there are random changes in the allele frequency, and this is due to chance events. So I'm gonna talk about two examples. One example is the founder effect. So if you look at this diagram here, we have an initial population here, who, which we refer to as the founder population. And in this founder population, you can see that it's about like half red and half blue. And then you can see that what has happened is that from the founder population, these smaller, smaller groups, which we call colonies, have moved away from the larger population. If you look at the smaller new colonies, you can see that the number of red and blue is quite different compared to the um, original population. So for instance, in this top group here, you can see that there are no blue um, dots at all, but and only red dots. And if you think of the dots as different alleles, you can see that in this population here, the frequency of red alleles is 100%, um, and it's very different from the original population. And in this way, you can see that this new colony here has a much decreased genetic diversity compared to this original population. Another example of this is the bottleneck effect. So this is when, when there is a sudden like large reduction in a population. And it's also due to a chance event because it's genetic drift, um, so it can be things such as an earthquake or a tsunami where a lot of people are unfortunately um, killed, which removes a lot of the alleles from the population. So this also will decrease gen genetic diversity. Okay, so now moving on to gene flow. This is when we're talking about um, the movement of alleles between one population and another. So if you look at this diagram here, you can see that there's a population of white beetles and a population of black beetles. So the white beetles, they have AA as their um, allele combination, and then the black beetles have big AA as their allele combination. And originally, um, let's say in the white um, beetle population, it's 100% little AA. However, suddenly you can see that there is a black beetle that is suddenly migrating into the white beetle population. This is gene flow. So you're suddenly getting the introduction of the big A allele into the um, white beetle population, which was all small AA. Um, yeah. Now let's move on to talk about natural selection. So natural selection is um, talking about how there are different selection pressures um, within the environment, and this can alter the allele frequencies of a um, gene pool. What's important about natural selection is that um, there must be pre-existing variation in the gene pool. So people can't all be exactly the same. People have to be different. And this variation must be able to be inherited. So this means that um, the alleles from the parents must be able to be passed on to the children. Um, natural selection, we, in natural selection, we often talk about survival of the fittest. So um, this was kind of the theory put forward by Charles Darwin. So this is where we're saying that organisms which have the most successful allelic combinations under a certain um, environmental, in a certain environment, they're the ones that are able to survive and then mate and reproduce and then pass on their alleles to the next generation. So examples of some selective pressures or agents, these include things such as climate change, um, infectious disease, um, also pollution. So um, this is here is just a framework that you guys can use to answer your um, natural selection questions. So if you're ever asked to kind of explain how a um, how natural selection has occurred, um, you can use this frame this acronym here. So it's Vestige. So V is for variation, E is for environment, S is for selection pressure, I is for inheritance, and G is for generations. And I thought I might just give you guys an example of how to apply the acronym um, so that you, you have a better of an idea of how it works. So this is an example talk, talking about pep and moths. So I think this is like in, um, this is a real life example. Um, um, I think it's in like um, Britain or something, but what happened is that, um, Originally, there was actually a higher population of white um, colored moths. And that's because the trees that the moths live in, 
they're covered with lichen and lichen is this kind of algae that is white so the trees um, their bark looked white and here we're talking the the selective agent that we're talking about is the birds so what happened is that the white moss they were actually better able to survive because they were able to camouflage against the white bark and not be seen by the birds that preyed on them compared to the black moths and as a result initially the the white moths were the ones that were better able to survive um, mate and reproduce and pass on their alleles to the next generation so originally the white moths they were in a higher proportion in the population However, what happened during the industrial Revolu revolution is that because the factory started um, burning coal for fuel, those trees that were covered with lichen, they became covered in soot. So now instead of having white bark, the bark was now dark. And if you think about it, now the white moths, instead of being able to camouflage easily, they're actually more, um, they stand out more against the black bark. So now in this case, the darker colored moss, they're actually better able to camouflage against the dark bark. So they're the ones that are now better able to um, mate, um, reproduce and pass on their alleles to the next generation. So here, um, this, in this message example, I'm, trying to, I'm talking about before the industrial revolution, why the light colored moths were actually the ones that were better able to survive. So V, once again, that's for variation. So you would say there is pre-existing genetic variation in the moths. Some moths are dark colored and some moths are light colored. E, we're talking about environment. So the trees are covered with lichen, which makes the bark light colored. S, so here, this is the selective agent, which is the birds. So the black moths are at a selective disadvantage as they're more prominent on the light colored bark and hence easily spotted by the birds. I, we're talking about inheritance. So the light colored moths are better able to survive, reproduce and pass on the alleles to the next generation. And G is for generation. Over many generations, the frequency of light colored alleles increase and frequency of dark colored alleles decrease. So hopefully that example kind of gives you an idea of how you can apply that vestige acronym, which I find really helpful to use um, in the exam questions. Um, if you guys want to, you can also try um, applying the vestige acronym to why the dark colored um, moths were actually high in, pro in proportion um, following the industrial revolution. I also have this example here that also helps, allows you guys to apply the vestige um, acronym, but I might let you guys try that in your own time because it is quite a hefty, um, it's, it's quite a hefty question, but this is also the answer there for you guys to look at afterwards. So now we're gonna talk about allopatric speciation. So first to define what species and speciation means. So species are a group of organisms that can interbreed to produce viable fertile offspring. And speciation, as the name suggests, it's the formation of a new species. And allopatric speciation, it it's a type of speciation. So what happens is that um, in allopatric speciation, if we take this as an example, um, you get this geographical separation of a population from a parent, this, sorry, this is a typo, this is meant to be parent species. And um, what happens is that um, the separated population would change over time from the parent species. So in this example, you have um, squirrels. And what happens is, what happened actually was that the squirrels became divided by the Grand Canyon. So the Grand Canyon here is that geographic um, barrier that's separating the two populations. And what happened over time was that because the squirrels were separated by the Grand Canyon, they couldn't interact with each other. So this means that no gene flow happened between the top two populations. And because they were living in different environments, they were subject to different selection pressures. And as a result of that, um, they um, evolved over time to the point where they actually became different species and they weren't able to interbreed with each other to form viable fertile offspring. So um, when you get an allopatric speciation question, I also have another acronym that you guys can use um, to answer questions relating to that. But I will let you read that in your own time because it's quite similar to the vestige acronym. So now we're gonna talk about selective breeding. So this is when humans, they will select specific um, desired phenotypes that they think are desired. And they're gonna use these phenotypes to be the parents of the next generation. So for instance, if you think about pugs, um, humans have selected pugs that um, have um, what they have, what they perceive as desired phenotypes. So that's things like having more wrinkles, having a more squashed, flatter nose. 
And because of that, over time, we, now the pogs that we see around all kind of look like this. What happens with this, with selective breeding, is that it promotes specific alleles, but it also decreases gen genetic diversity. So this means that because all the, um, all, the spe all the organisms in that population kind of resemble each other, the number of alleles, the diversity in the number of, in the, the diversity in the alleles is quite limited. And because of the genetic decreased genetic by variation, this means that, for instance, if a new selection pressure um, happened, the population is actually less adaptable. Um, and they're actually at an increased risk of extinction. So now we're going to talk about um, what are some evidence of bio biological change over time. So first, let's talk about fossils. So far, fossils are the preservation of hardened remains or traces of organisms in rocks. And this occurs over a really long period of time. So it takes like thousands and millions of years. And it's actually quite a rare event. And that's because it, you need quite specific environmental circumstances to allow fossilization to happen. Um, things that can help increase the chance of fossilization include things like rapid burial, low oxygen levels, lack of decomposers, alkaline soil, dry climate, cold climate, and lack of scavengers. So basically, if these factors just allow the preservation of the, um, the dead um, organism um, before fossilization. So to talk about the steps in fossilization, first what, hap first what happens is that you get the um, organism dying. So in this example here, you have an ammonite. So the ammonite dies, and then you have rapid burial of the ammonite and it's not exposed to any of the elements so it remains pres preserved and then over time you will get these layers of sediment building on top of the ammonite and you're also going to get erosion of the soft tissue and as you get more and more layers of this sediment building up over the ammonite what happens is that because of the pressure of the lady the layers building up over time um, the, the sediment actually forms these different rock layers and over time, the hard tissue, so the shell in the case of the ammonite, actually becomes replaced with minerals. So this is called permineralization. And then eventually, um, the fossil may become exposed, and that can be due to like weathering or erosion of the rock. So this table here just provides some examples of fossils. Um, I might just allow you guys to read that in your own time. That's OK. So now we're going to talk about how we date fossils. So there's two main ways of dating fossils. Um, there's relative dating and there's absolute dating. With relative dating, it's a more um, approximate way of dating the rock. So you're not actually going to be giving a numerical value. It's more about how old one fossil is relative to another fossil. Whereas in the case of absolute dating, that's when you're more you're being more specific and you're trying to like. Um, provide an actual like numerical age of how old the fossil is. So with relative dating, you can use um, the principle of superstition. And basically that just means that um, older, um, the newest rock layers, they're the ones that are going to be de deposited last. So they're the ones that you're gonna find closer to the sur Earth's surface. Whereas the older rock layers, they're the ones that are gonna be found um, more further down. And those, so um, the older fossils, or that because the so therefore the older fossils, they're going to be found in the older rock layers, so they're going to be lower down. Whereas the newer fossils, they're going to be found in the newer rock layers, so they're going to be higher up. You can also use the principle of correlation. So in this case, you're using index fossils, and index fossils they're quite unique. They are fossils that are only found in the rock layers of one time period. So using index fossils you can then kind of work out the relative age of the other fossils and yeah that can help you to work out the ages so now moving on to absolute dating um, an example of this is radiometric dating so we're using um, the half-life or specific radioactive elements to try and work out the age of the fossil so this uses the fact that various elements um, which we call parents they will decay to form stable daughter products so for instance, carbon-14, so this is the parent isotype, is going to decay to form nitrogen-14, which is the daughter product. And the half time is the time taken for half of the original radioactive isotype to decay. So you can see here in this graph, this is the starting amount of the um, of carbon-14. And here you can see that this is when there is half of carbon-14, half the amount of the original amount of carbon-14 left over. 
And this is the half-life, so the time taken to reach that amount. And this can help estimate the age of the rock and therefore infer the age of the fossil that is found in that rock layer. So carbon-14, um, this is one, this is the um, radioactive, radioactive isotype that we commonly use. Its daughter product, like I mentioned before, is nitrogen-14, and its half-life is 5,730 years. So for instance, if you're trying to date a fossil and you measure the amount of carbon-14 and nitrogen-14, and you find, for instance, that it's 50-50, um, that's gonna tell you that um, the, that fossil is actually 5,730 years. And that's because you know that carbon-14 has only decayed by one half-life. Um, one thing to remember, which is important, is that carbon-14 is actually only useful for dating fossils up to the ages of 60,000. And that's because like by the time um, 60,000 years have passed, there's too little carbon-14 for it to be re re reliably uh, measured. So now moving on to talk about biogeography. So this is a study of like different life forms over different geographical areas. And basically this provides evidence of, bio of evolution over time because um, we find that those species that are more closely related, they're usually found in closer proximity to each other. Now um, we'll talk about developmental biology. And this also provides evidence for evolution because when people study the early de developmental forms of different um, animals, what you can see is that in these early forms, they actually quite resemble each other. And this just tells us that um, these, all, these organisms all actually share an ancestor. And from this ancestor, um, these different animals have actually evolved over time to form the different animals that they are today. So now talking, moving on to talk about structural morphology, um, I might just go to the next slide first and explain the difference between divergent and convergent evolution. So divergent, as the name suggests, diverge, it means to kind of like split, right? So what happens is that you have a original species and then it splits to form two different species. So these two species, species B and C, they share a recent common ancestor. So the recent common ancestor is species A. But because of different selection pressures, these two species have evolved to become different and they have formed these two species. And for, on the other hand, for convergent evolution, converge, it means kind of like come together. So you can see that here are species A and B, um, they're unrelated, but they have kind of evolved over time under the same similar selection pressures to develop structures that are similar in function or phenotype. So just going back, um, you can see um, here that there's homologous structures and analogous structures. And these structures kind of give us evidence for different, so would give us evidence for either conversion or divergent evolution. So homologous structures, they give us evidence for divergent evolution. Um, so this is where, so here we can see here in these, in these um, four pictures, you can kind of see that the bones that make up the um, limb of these animals, you can kind of see they kind of resemble each other. And this suggests diver diver divergent evolution and that these different organisms have um, evolved from a common ancestor. And the way to remember this is that homologous structures, homo means same. On the other hand, for analogous structures, we want to think about, um, if you think about the word analog, um, if you think of the word analogy, that kind of means like similar. So in this case, we're talking about convergent evolution. So these, um, organisms, they don't actually share a recent common ancestor. But what's happened is that because they kind of share similar, uh, they kind of been living in the same environment and have been under the same selection pressures, they have developed structures. So in this case, these like fin, the fin of the shark, um, the kind of flipper of the penguin and the dolphin's fin, they've kind of, they kind of have developed a structure that is similar. And then we call these structures analogous structures. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how we can determine the relatedness between different species. So one method is by molecular homology. So here we're kind of looking at the DNA sequence or the protein sequence of different organisms. And the basic idea is that if, a, um, if two species, they're more closely related, it's more likely that their DNA sequences are going to be more similar because there's been less time for mutations to have accumulated within DNA sequence. 
Um, mitochondrial DNA is often used um, in molecular homology, and that's because mitochondrial DNA is actually only inherited down the maternal line. So this means that your father doesn't actually provide you any mitochondrial DNA. And um, the part of the mitochondrial DNA that is often analyzed is actually the non-coding region. So the non-coding region just means that it doesn't actually encode for any proteins. And that's because the non-coding region actually has a high mutation rate compared to the coding region. So this is the region where we look at um, and compare to try and work out how um, two species are related. DNA hybridization is also a useful tool in trying to work out how similar two organisms are. So this, in this tool, what happens is that you take the DNA from two different species and you heat up the, the DNA so that the two strands separate. So now it's like single stranded. And then you mix the single strands together. And then you allow this mixture to cool and then the strands can pair. And what happens is that um, during the cooling and the pairing, you can actually get strands from species, a single strand from species A pairing with a single strand from species B. And then depending on how complementary the two strands are, so how similar they are in terms of their gene sequence, that's gonna determine how much pairing there is. And basically the more pairing there is, the more similar the DNA sequences are, suggesting that they're more closely related. So here we can see that if you compare species A with species B, here there's less, there's less pairing compared to species A and species C. So here we would say that species A and species C are more closely rated, related compared to species A and species B. So for the phylogenetic trees, also a way to kind of show the evolutionary relationship between different organisms. So this is a phylogenetic tree. Um, just to explain a little bit about what the different parts of the phylogenetic tree represent. So here there will be a time scale. So these are the ancestors, these are the present day species. This here is a node and it represents the um, most common recent ancestor of A and B in this case. Oh, sorry. A and B are the um, descendants of this node here. And they're also called sister taxa. And then the branches here just provide kind of the relationship between different um, a species and their ancestor. So here's a question here. Um, if you guys wanted to try it out and put your answers in the chat, that would be good. Um, you could probably only really mark, do the first question because the second one requires you to mark on the paper. So maybe just try the first question in the chat and I'll give you guys like a minute for that. Okay, so it looks like we have an answer in the chat. Let's just look at the um, answers. Okay, so the answer is actually um, these two species here. And they're the most closely related because you can see that if you look at the time scale, they've actually split from their most common recent ancestor, um, the most, they have, they're the ones that have split from their most common recent, recent ancestor. Um, most, it's like less time has passed since they've, they've split from their most common recent ancestor. So I think someone might have said that it's these two here, but if you look, this one has actually split at a later time compared to these two species. So these two species here are actually more closely related. So the way to try and work out which species are most closely related, what I would do is I would look at the time scale, then I would look for the branches that split most close towards this end, because that means that they have, the, their time of divergence has been the most um, 
how do I explain this? Um, there has been the less the least amount of time has passed since their divergence. Hopefully that makes sense, but if it doesn't, yeah. So it's just the time that has it's been since the two species diverged. Yes, you're right, um, Guangzhou. That's correct. Yeah. So hopefully that makes sense. Sorry, my explanation was a bit wordy. <laughs> it was hard to explain, but hopefully it's okay. Okay, and I'll just like tell you guys the um, second question. So this question, you're trying to mark which node represents the most recent common ancestor of these two species here. So what I would what I would do is I would locate first the two species. So first, this is the first species here. This is the second species here. And what you do is you trace backwards and you try to find, oh, sorry. You try to find the node where they meet up. So you can see when you trace back here and you trace back here, this is the first node where they meet, meet up. So this node would therefore represent the most recent common ancestor. Hopefully that makes sense, but if it doesn't, um, let me know in the chat and I can try to further explain that. Okay, if not, I will move on. So now we're gonna talk about human change over time. So this is talking about the evolution of humans over time. So this table here kind of just gives the different classification, classification of humans. Um, yep. And um, these, in these next few slides, I'll try to kind of go through the, some of the classifications. So for primates, we're talking about um, the prosimians, the new world monkeys, the old world monkeys, the apes and the humans. And for primates, some of their interesting shared characteristics include like a grasping hand, opposable thumb and big toe. So opposable thumb and big toe basically just means that you can touch your thumb to the fingers on the same hand. So you can like do this. And that's like helpful because it means that you can like grasp onto things. So you can grasp onto branches, but also, but it also means that you can like um, do fine manipulation. So that's things like writing with your pencil and that sort of thing. Okay. And you also have things such as bicuspid teeth. Um, so these are the premolars and they're used for grinding food um, as well as a well-developed eyes and brain. So these are for binocular and color vision as well as a long gestation period, which allows for more brain growth and extended parental care. So now we're talking about the superfamily, which is the hominoids. And this includes the great apes and the lesser apes, but not the new and old world monkeys. So features of hominoids is that they don't have a tail, and um, for locomotion, they can use brachiation, knuckle walking, or bipedalism. And their posture is usually partially or fully erect. So now for homonyms, so this is the tribe classification. This includes humans. So it includes Homo plus all the other extinct erect walking ancestors. So Australopithecus and all the other species. So um, the shared characteristics of homonyms is that they are all bipedal. So that's really important. That's a really important feature. And other things are like a more centralized foramen magnum. So the foramen magnum is just like the hole at the base of your skull and that's where your spinal cord exits. And the more centralized foramen magnum, um, it's just more centralized because um, it kind of helps support the head on the body when you're walking on two legs versus four legs. And homonyms also have a larger brain compared to the other apes. So, um, if we're thinking about the benefits of bipedalism, um, does anyone have any ideas of what about what are some benefits of bipedalism? If you guys want to put that in the chat. That's okay if no one knows, I can I have a slide on it. So some of the benefits of bipedalism are things like you're able to stand taller. So if you think about being on all fours versus standing up, um, you are able to stand taller. So you're better able to scan your environment, for instance, for like food or predators. It also allows for more efficient heat loss. It also frees the hands. So now you're able to do things with your hands such as manipulate tools as well as carry objects. And it also allows for increased endurance endurance, 
which allows you to run longer distances. So now we're just going to go quickly through the evolution of homonyms over time. And um, important to consider is that the human fossil is actually incomplete. So homonym of evolution is actually quite debatable and there isn't a very precise history about how we have developed over time. But it's important to remember that all homonyms are bipedal. So with Australopithecus, this is usually accepted as the earliest um, hominin fossil from which modern humans have evolved. Um, and, and species that fall under this genus are Australopithecus afarensis and Australopithecus africansis. Some of the features are that they are bipedal and they have a relatively small cranial capacity. So Homo habilis, they are often called the tall man and they lived in Eastern Africa. For Homo erectus, they are actually the only fossils found outside Africa. And they're often called upright man, so erectus upright. And there's evidence that they use fire, they use tools, they had clothing, they lived in huts and caves. And compared to Homo habilis, they're larger in size, they have a larger brain size, and they have thicker skulls. So Homo neanderthalensis, they actually coexisted with modern humans, but they're not thought to be ancestors of modern humans because the two species actually overlap in time. And compared to Homo sapiens, they had a lower, heavier skull, lower foreheads, more protruding jaws, and prominent brow ridges. And some reasons to why they may have become extinct is that they were unable to compete with Homo sapiens, um, but it could have also been due to like disease or war. Okay, so this question here, we're just um, is just a question about human change over time. So if you guys wanted to put your answer in the chat. Yeah, okay. So the answer is Z. So if you look at the answer, you can see that it says decreasing size of canines. Yes, that's true. Um, there's a decreasing size of canines because it kind of reflects our change in diet over time. So instead of having to kind of like rip into food because we develop certain tools that help us to make our food smaller, that's why our canines kind of decrease over time. Decreasing size of zygomatic arch. So the zygomatic arch is like, this bone here and it kind of like is the attachment side of different um, muscles that help with your eating. So it's decreasing size also kind of just suggests our change in our diet in which we don't need a strong um, like cheek muscles to help us chew, at, chew or tear, tear our food. Um, the increasingly bowl shaped pelvis, um, that's to help with our bipedal locomotion. So the bowl, sh the bowl shaped pelvis it actually is, uh, allows for greater stability because it kind of supports your body on your two legs. Also the increasing arch of feet. Yep. So that also is to do with our bipedal locomotion. So it helps us um, walk on our two feet and kind of the, the, the arch in the foot actually kind of acts like, a, acts like a lever to kind of like allow you to like spring as you're walking, if that makes sense. Okay, so. Um, let's look at the questions, sorry. Oops. So the first question, for their posture being erect, fully erect, does that mean they have an S-shaped spine and pelvis, which supports bipedalism? Um, with um, hominoids, not all of them were actually bipedal. So depending, because this encompasses both great, ape, great apes and lesser apes. 
So the lesser apes include, um, yeah, because this includes both great, great apes and lesser apes, some great apes, so such as like gorillas and chimpanzees, they actually use knuckle walking. So I'm not sure what that question is asking, but I would say um, if you're talking about the S-shaped spine and the bowel-shaped pelvis, it's kind of more talking about um, with the S-shaped spine and the bowel-shaped pelvis, you're kind of seeing the, it's kind of like the last question where it's talking about as humans have evolved over time, you have seen this trend, which has resulted in an increasingly S-shaped spine and an increasingly bowel-shaped pelvis. And because of this increasingly S-shaped spine and increasingly bowel-shaped pelvis, that's what's helped to support our bipedal locomotion. Does that make sense? Hopefully that does. Yeah, while we have paused for questions, there was one more. Um, did Homo Neanderthals used to live in colder climates? That's what the question is. Um, did you know the answer for that, Matt? Relatively, I would say relatively. Yeah. But um, I'm not sure what this stems from. Uh, yeah. like the ability to stay in colder climates. So if someone could just back up where the question is coming from. So it's like a trait of evolution. Is this referring to the S-shaped spine and the bow-shaped pelvis? Because yeah, yeah, that's like a trait of evolution. So it's kind of like, as you're developing from Australopithecus to Homo sapiens, your spine is going to, I guess, get more S-shaped and it's gonna have more of a bow shaped for your pelvis because it's it's becoming, uh, it's like, it's forming structures that will be better able to support bipedal locomotion, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay, cool. Sorry, do we have time for one more? There was one regarding phylogenetic trees. Uh, it reads as, so it doesn't matter how many ancestors they have diverged from, right? Just how long it's been between the two species. Yeah, I think I answered that. It's about the time that it's the time. diverged. Mm. It's not how many species. Because mm. if you think about it, if it has di if less time has passed since it's diverged, they're more likely to be more related, right? Because it's the mm. less time has passed for mutations to occur and stuff. True. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think there were any other questions then. Okay. Well, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat. Otherwise, we might take a short break till um, seven o'clock and then we'll come back with Aero Study 2. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. We are back live again. Um, so welcome again, everyone. Now we'll be moving on to the second area of study for unit four. We'll be covering things about uh, PCR, gelid apoprosis, recombinant plasmids, and things like gene cloning and their implication on society. We will also briefly touch on antibiotics, antivirals, and GMOs. But getting started with DNA manipulations first. So as you may already be aware, um, enzymes play a crucial role in all of these processes, whether it's about PCR or of uh, gene cloning or having recombinant plasmids, certain enzymes are really crucial. So we'll just touch base on each of these briefly and then come back to those within their role um, in a particular process. So starting off with restriction enzymes, you can consider them as molecular scissors, which will cut the DNA or your gene of interest, depending on the presence of recognition site. Now, obviously, if we were to um, do any sort of uh, analysis, on the whole genome of an organism, it will be a lot of uh, time and resources wasted for no reason. So to target which gene of interest we will be playing with, for lack of a better term, we use molecular scissors or restriction enzymes. These are also known as endonucleases, essentially um, bracketing things based on the recognition sites. 
And when they actually cut them, they can either leave these sticky ends, which have overhanging bits, or blunt ends. Sticky ends just allow for things to bind later on. So the fragments to bind later on because of complementary base pairing. And blunt ends, obviously, that will not be the case. But there are enzymes like ligases that can help them glue up together if needed, which takes us to the next slide, which is on ligases. So like I said, these are just uh, acting like glue tech to join the DNA. It's important to note, when I say join the DNA, I'm not talking about the join between these ones because complementary base pairing occurs based on hydrogen bonds. What ligase is actually join the, um, the phosphodiester bonds and the DNA. So if I consider this as a DNA, over here we have the hydrogen bond, but the rocks themselves, of the letter aren't joined by their hydrogen bonds, they are joined by phosphodiester bonds. And these are the bonds that ligase facilitates. Notice how I'm saying ligase facilitates because if you guys remember from yesterday, enzymes don't work magic. They can only make things better or speed up the process. Ligase is an enzyme. If the two blunt ends weren't gonna join, they will not join. But if they were gonna join, ligase just helps the process. So, sorry, do we? So bond the nucleotides. Uh, yes, they do bond the nucleotides. So there was a question in the chat, sorry. So the question was, do they bond nucleotides? They do bond nucleotides, but they bond the phosphodiester bonds. So if I were to draw two DNA strands here, the whole unit is called nucleotides. The ones overhanging here, so the A, C, G, T, all of those are nitrogenous bases. These nitrogenous bases bond via hydrogen bonding, but because they are still part of nucleotides, we can't just say phosphodiesters bond nucleotides. They bond the backbone of nucleotide chains. So this is where the phosphodiester bonds would be. The ones between the nitrogenous bases would actually be hydrogen bonding. Hope that clarifies it. If not, happy to come back to it with a better <laughs> DNA diagram than the squiggly drawing at the end of the um, conversation. But for now, we'll just move on. Um, yeah, but okay, great. Let me clear the mess and move on. Oopsie. So in terms of putting things into context, the first technique that we need to be aware of is PCR. Um, PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Uh, for each of the techniques that we are covering today, it's important to understand the, the reason that they occur and how we can achieve that. So in terms of the reason, it's to amplify the target DNA. Again, the term target DNA is a synonymous with gene of interest, but it's important to not switch this with just DNA because that would imply that you're referring to the whole genome, which is not the case yet. In terms of what we need, the recipe, we obviously need tag polymerase. We need primers to guide the tag polymerase. We need nucleotides because otherwise, what are we going to add? And obviously, we need the DNA sample because what are we amplifying? So in terms of the process now, there's three main steps. As you may remember, there's denaturation, annealing, extension. Denaturation is just to cook up the DNA and break the hydrogen bonds. So these are the hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases. Once the, the bonds have been broken, we are essentially providing space for RNA polymerase, oh, sorry, for type polymerase to come in. But before it starts coming in, we obviously need to guide where it should start um, synthesizing from. So for that, we have primers. Primers are nucleotide bases of uh, three to five pairs approximately. And those we can design in a lab to bracket the DNA that we want to be synthesized. So for example, if we look at this one, there will be DNA upstream and downstream of the segment. But what we will do is we would design a primer to bind here and that sort of signals to the tag polymerase to come and start synthesizing from this end onwards. And it'll happen to both ends, both the five prime and three prime and the anti-parallel strand as well, which is why with each cycle, we have extra copy synthesized. Um, so again, ignoring the squiggly lines, this actually does a better job at explaining what annealing is. Um, after annealing has occurred, we need to again, raise up the temperature. Uh, these temperature ranges, I would definitely recommend memorizing uh, 95, 50, 60, and 72. The reason we need to heat it up is because we can't cool it. Uh, sorry. The reason we need to cool it down first is because, like I said, we had just boiled up the hydrogen bonds. Primers would bond via hydrogen as well. 
So if we keep it at 95, that's not going to happen. That's why we bring it down to 50, 60s. Then we need to raise it up again because this tag polymerase isn't actually a human. It comes from uh, bacteria, which is used to being in uh, highly, uh, what's the word, in very hot environments, essentially. So if we provide it 72 degrees, it might actually be a more optimal state for it to function. Again, linking back to area of study one from yesterday, enzymes have their optimal ranges. So that's why we need to bring it up to 72 degrees for it to work at its maximum efficiency. Um, so yeah, just to rewind it all, uh, obviously memorize the names of each step, um, the temperature ranges, why it's happening, and why is it only happening at that particular temperature range? And I think that should suffice all that we need to know. Moving on to the next one, where the DNA samples will then be analyzed using gel electrophoresis. Um, in this one, the process has been summarized for you, which you can have a look at later on. But the main things you need to know is DNA is negative because of the phosphate. And in each of these wells, you essentially be putting in different samples that have been treated with same restriction enzymes. So those restriction enzymes, depending on how many recognition sites there are, would have chopped up the DNA into different fragments. Now, the fragments that are longer would obviously stay back compared to fragments that are shorter because they can just swim across. And that is what um, is sort of the basic principles of why gel electrophoresis can do what it does, uh, which is essentially separating out different DNAs. Um, so if a question comes up regarding why is DNA moving, it is moving because this setup has been charged positive to negative and DNA is negatively charged. So it would move to the positive end. And in terms of why different fragments stay back and these ones move further is because they have been cut into different fragments by the restriction enzymes. And obviously the ones that are longer stay behind and the other ones can swim across through the agarose gel. Again, if there's any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. But meanwhile, we'll just move on to an example question. So have a read through this and yeah, just put whatever you think in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself as well if you would like to share your answer. We do have an answer. Option B, okay. Okay, so we have two words for option B, which is actually the right answer. So this is how it works. Here's the DNA from the crime scene, and they're asking for which a suspect's DNA matches. So what you would have to do is try to look for a fragment of the same size as this fragment, because that would imply that uh, there is a particular sequence with the recognition sites that the enzyme would have cut it at. Um, the other thing that I forgot to mention actually was DNA letter. So sometimes DNA letter is put in and it's essentially like a reference scale, if you will call it, because we have uh, known sizes of different fragments chopped up and running across from this well. So if I have a band over here for 100 base pairs, um, let's say I want to check the sizes for these two. What I can do is refer to this one as 100 base pairs and then compare how it might be. Also, if I'm running the gel on the crime scene DNA in a separate set, and I'm running the suspects one in a separate set, obviously I won't be able to compare them. But if I throw in the same DNA letter, then I'll be able to compare based on fragment sizes. So that's the whole point of having the DNA letter there. Again, hope I haven't confused anyone. If I have, feel free to put it in the chat and we'll come back to it. Meanwhile, let's move on to a few more techniques. Um, so the techniques that we have covered so far, can be used for gene cloning, uh, which is essentially making multiple copies of the same gene, again, cloning. Examples of this include PCR and recombinant plasmids. So recombinant plasmids, again, is an example where we have um, a particular gene of interest inserted into a bacterial plasmid. And because plasmids are known for replicating independently, every time a plasmid replicates, it will also replicate your gene of interest. So that is another way that we can create multiple clones of the same gene. The other technique is DNA profiling. Um, so with DNA profiling, 
there are parts of DNA uh, that are more unique than others. An example of those could be short term and repeats. So these are just unique segments. Um, obviously, we, we won't be able to scan exactly what the codons are within that segment. But if we know that different people have different, seg different number of segments, we can use things like general electrophoresis to compare which fragments exist where. Uh, and the last one is genetic screening. So there's multiple tests in place um, to test for genetic abnormalities or any risk of developing those. Um, with each of these techniques, however, there are ethical implications because where do we really draw the line? Because with DNA profiling, it's, I mean, we don't give our social media account passwords to anyone. Here we are getting a DNA profile. So there's risks on how the privacy will be maintained there. Um, obviously, there are things in place to make sure that it is maintained, but it's one of the common ethical concerns. Uh, for genetic screening, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but nothing, can, none of the machines can really be perfect, as you might imagine. So if a couple is uh, told that their, um, their offspring might have, their child might have, sorry, a particular genetic disorder, but there are risks of false positives as well on this condition, which means the machine is saying that there might be a risk, but there might not actually be a risk. You can imagine the emotional, um, the emotional trauma that the couple will have to endure. So which is why there are certain ethical conditions associated with each of these techniques. Um, it would be good to have a basic understanding of those. Um, but overall, this is all the, uh, this is like a very brief summary of why the techniques exist and what the common examples are. So moving on to GMOs and transgenic organisms. So a genetically modified organism, as the name suggests, is an organism that has had its genes modified in a certain way. If that modification is that it got genes inserted from somewhere else, then it's called transgenic. So every transgenic is a GMO, but every GMO is not a transgenic organism. In terms of the potential benefits of these techniques, um, obviously, there would be, there are com uh, obvious limitations of why we can't do it in humans, of course. But when it comes to animals, um, ranging from aesthetics to utility, there can be many benefits. In terms of utility, it's mostly referred to crops, um, which means you can have a particular color of corn available, for example, or there might be increased shelf life for particular crops, um, or many other benefits or resistance against a particular pests. That's why transgenic organisms are commonly, uh, or, trans, or modifying rather the genome is commonly allowed for plants. Um, so that's that. And moving on to the next topic, which is about antibiotics and resistance. So when it comes to um, bacterial cells, their survival depends on certain reasons, certain regions in the bacterial cell, such as the cell wall and the DNA, just to name a few. So if we are trying to kill a bacterial cell, obviously we should be designing drugs that target and inhibit uh, regular functioning of those parts of the cell. So when we are designing an antibiotic, uh, considering inhibition of the cell wall synthesis, or maybe poking holes into the membrane or not allowing the DNA to be synthesized, um, or just inhibiting any other metabolic pathways would essentially make the survival hard for bacteria. When it comes to making the survival hard for bacteria, not every antibiotic would kill the bacteria uh, because some are known to be bacteriostatic and others are cidal. So some will kill, but some will just restrain its growth. Um, that's one thing. The other reason why they can't kill is because bacteria has uh, grown smarter over years. Um, for a range of reasons, which we won't be discussing now, bacteria has developed antibiotic resistance, which means it has developed a way of uh, having efflux pump where it can kick out the antibiotic. It has deactivating enzymes. It can chew up the antibiotic, or it can just block the entry as well. And this explains why we have things like MRSA, meaning, or just a classic example of how it's becoming harder and harder for us to um, win over and uh, a type of bacteria, which we could previously, but can't because the bacteria has grown smarter and unfortunately developed resistance. So that's how we can tackle bacteria. Moving on to the next topic, which is about antivirals. Again, when it comes to viruses, 
Why they differ from bacterial cells is because they need to actually insert their DNA into the host cell for them to function. So bacterial infection has six main steps. It has to attach. The packaging has to, the capsid has to uncoat. After uncoating, there has to be DNA replication. Then there has to be further capsid synthesis, virion assembly, and which will then be released to infect other cells. In terms of the antivirals, if we can inhibit any of these steps, as you can imagine, we would be preventing the virion from going out. So we are not killing the virus with antivirals. We are just preventing it from spreading further. When it comes to killing the cells that have been infected by this, we have things like natural killer cells. But because there's only so much that those cells can do, you can imagine if we can stop the release of these virions and just the virus twinning, sort of, uh, we will be able to further assist our immunological responses. So that's how antivirals work. And as you can obviously tell, this is um, significantly different from bacterials because in bacteria, that is an extracellular pathogen and does not really need to insert its DNA into the host cell like viruses do. So that's that. Um, but all the antibiotics and antivirals that I've been talking about have come about due to a rational drug design approach. So as the term suggests, rational, we're just being logical about the drug that we are designing and how we design it. It usually starts by identifying the target molecule. Then we determine the shape of the active site or the binding site where the target molecule is of, of, of the target molecule and where it binds to as well. After that, we'll try to search for any existing resources which would fit into the criteria that we are looking for. Then we can use computer-aided designs to design a new drug, modify the existing ones, or just design a new one. After that, its uh, testing will be, its uh, binding will be tested in petri dishes and stuff. Then um, cultured in cells and animal models and essentially in clinical trials. Um, not to bombard you with extra information, but the number of uh, options that we have available to what actually makes up until here is, uh, is quite low actually, because there's a lot that can happen in this process. Um, for example, the drugs that we might design for inhibiting particular synthesis, um, maybe the cell wall synthesis, it might work really well um, on a computerized program, but if it has resistance, we can't guarantee how it's gonna turn out over here. But eventually the ones that do come up to the clinical trials or testing in humans will then be tested for their safety, efficacy, if there's any potential toxicity before they get approved. Um, so that's a summary of rational drug design. A common example that you may remember studying about is Relenza, which is a new raminidase inhibitor. It's essentially preventing the binding. So the virion does not progress further. And that is an example of something that came about using this drug design. Um, so that brings us to the end of the theory part for area of study two. Now let's try and go through some questions. So here's the first one. As earlier, feel free to put your answers in the chat or unmute yourself and just share the answer here. Alrighty, so we do have an answer in the chat. Thank you. Uh, the answer is option B. Anyone agreeing, disagreeing? Okay, so we have two votes for B, which is actually the right answer. So just to recap why that's the case, the question goes that there's an increasing trend of infectious bacteria showing resistance to antibiotics. The implication of this is that uh, it will be replaced by antivirals not quite the case because antivirals, as we know, only work on virals, intracellular stuff. Um, second one, simple bacterial infections may become life-threatening. That seems plausible. Third one, hospital stays will become shorter. Does not seem logical, unfortunately. Um, and the last one, a person's immune cells will, have, will adapt to overcome antibiotic resistance. Um, the cells adapting, first of all, this option itself is an absolute, saying that it will adapt. So that obviously raises suspicion. 
And also the immune cell and antibiotic resistance, like I said, there might be uh, a partnership going on between the body's own immunity and antibiotics, but having them adapting to overcome antibiotic resistance, not very likely. They might be able to develop ways of tackling that bacteria, but they're not overcoming antibiotic resistance, uh, which is why option B was the answer. Moving on to the next one. Um, okay, we do have an answer. So the answer is suggesting that it would be option C, just reiterating. So GMO is genetically modified organisms, not genetically mutated. So would anyone want to have another go at it? D, laboratory produced organism, okay. Uh, the answer would actually be A, transgenic. So just to go back a few slides. There we go. So as it says here, uh, the GMO is a genetically modified organism. Sorry, it. Genetically modified organism. So it has had its DNA changed in some way. One of those ways could be to insert someone else's DNA in it, which is why we say every T uh, transgenic organism is a GMO. So if I were to draw, uh, I'm not sure if this was called a Venn diagram or whatever, maths isn't one of my strengths, but if the whole circle is for GMOs, the transgenics would be a part of it. So a genetically modified organism could have being modified by a substitution mutation or uh, inversion, duplication, all of those mutations that we covered earlier on. But a transgenic is the one that has had DNA from somewhere else inserted in it. So that's the difference between transgenics and GMOs. Uh, I'll just clear the mess and move on to the questions. Oopsie. Yep. So which means if we look at this one, this yeast, whose name I'm not going to try to pr pronounce here, let's just call it the yeast. The yeast can be modified and made to express a human gene. So the yeast has been modified to express a human gene, which is a different organism, resulting in the production of insulin. So it could be accurately described as a transgenic organism. Yes. B, yes, but not quite. Uh, C, like I said, it's not mutated. And D, it's, it's a laboratory modified, but it's not produced. So that's why the option was A. If this option C was genetically modified organism, Yes, it would mean technically that there's two right answers, but A would be more specific. Or if the option said um, that yeast was modified by one of the mutations that we covered earlier on, and then this option was genetically modified, then C would have been the answer. But in this case, genetically mutated isn't the term, it's genetically modified. And either way, it won't be the answer because we have the uh, gene inserted from another organism. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Uh, if there's any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Meanwhile, we'll move on to the next one. Okay. Okay, that was pretty fast. So the answer is A. Hopefully, we came up to A after eliminating the other ones. Uh, one of the common pitfalls is picking A without reading the other options. But in this case, A was in fact the answer. Let's still go through why it couldn't be any other. Um, DNA ligase does not act as a molecular scissor. That's endonucleases or restriction enzymes. Um, and it clearly does not cut the DNA. It does the complete opposite. Uh, it separates to two strands during transcription. So there, a copy can be made, not at all. Uh, in fact, in transcription, we, we only start um, using this term way beyond the topic on transcription. So if anyone couldn't really make sense of option D, think about where this comes up overall in the course as well. It started coming up when we were talking about 
modifying the DNA artificially, not naturally. So transcription and ligases wouldn't really work out. Um, but yeah, the, side, the logical reason obviously being that it does not separate, it actually joins. Um, last one, is an enzyme involved in protein synthesis? Not quite, because protein synthesis, transcription, translation, again, we only study about DNA ligases much later on. So option C and D, even if you didn't remember exactly, hypothetically speaking, if this were an exam question, I wouldn't go with C or D because like I said, ligases start appearing much later in the course. This isn't like an error-proof method, but just sharing an approach. Um, and then I would have decided between A and B. Molecular scissors, I know that that's a, like the jargon, not the jargon, that's the layperson term for uh, restriction enzymes. So that's why I would have picked A. But obviously if you did have a, basic understanding of DNA ligases. Like I said, you wouldn't have had to read through the other options in that much of detail. Just skim through them and make sure you're confident they're wrong. And then pick A, um, which is that it joins them together, forming phosphodiester bonds between the two fragments. Okay, so if there are any other questions, anyone would like me to clarify any of the MCQs? Oh, okay. In that case, Thank you so much for joining us for today and good luck for your exams. Um, more importantly, good luck for term four as well. And just a reminder, here are a few other platforms that you can look at. So we do have similar revision sessions for other subjects as well. And you can find out more information about all of those on our Facebook page, on our website. If you have any queries regarding any of the sessions today, um, feel free to send through an email. And yeah, other than that, I don't have much else to add. Eve, do you have anything else to add? Anything I missed? No, no. Just wanted to oh. wish everyone good luck as well for your exams. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. you.